with our clients, with our investors. How are we showing up? What impact are we ha having? I've gone deeper to go, okay, mindset's important. Self-awareness is important. But I found on my journey that that wasn't enough. So I went even deeper and I was like, what else is there that is in alignment with your vision and your values? And we start to get clarity on this next level of you. And that's where the magic happens. What I find is that personality tools tend to box you, yeah. but what the Enneagram tends to do is it builds this self-awareness. And most importantly, it gets you to understand why do I do what I do? There's I a difference this. between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and we popped over the pond today to talk to my friend Tracy Clark over in the UK. Tracy, how are you? I'm really well, Jerome, and thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, I think it's an honor to have you here. And I think the listeners, if they get their notepads out, are going to realize how fortunate they are to have you with them on this journey today. And so I love to start these episodes when I have founders who have had an exit with. So Tracy, you had an exit. Yes, I did indeed. So my brother and I had our own company called the CWC Group. We worked in the oil and gas events industry. So we worked all over the world. So our, our events happened from places in Africa to Latin America, to the Middle East and Asia. And we worked with um, government and also uh, top levels of industry. And um, yeah, we grew the company over 20 years and then we sold it about, I think it was about three years ago. So. So you get the wire and you're looking at it or you get the check and you're looking at it. I suspect that it's more money than you ever had in your bank account at one time, but that might not be true for you. Uh, what are you thinking when you get to that magical moment? I'm thinking what an exciting journey it's been and how much I've learned. Um, and now how I really want to support other founders to create their exits and also to overcome some of the some of the challenges that we had. We had some great ups. We won two Queen's Awards for International Trade. In a period of five years, we grew profit by over 450%. So we had some really good wins, but we also had some challenges, as does every founder. And when we came up to the sale, Jerome, we had a consultant come in. And it was in those last few years that I realized there was so much I hadn't known earlier on in my in our in our business around leadership and mindset and maybe team dynamics. And so it then took me on a parallel journey of building this company to become a coach and to really try and understand what the source of success was and what were those magical ingredients that I could now incorporate when I was work, when I am working with founders and how I can then blend that and fuse that with the, with the commercial experience that I had. So that's what I was thinking in that moment. How can I help others make an impact and learn from some of the challenges and the ups that we had? Wow. So you moved right into impact. How did you know that that was the place that you should go? Because I think a lot of folks get caught up in, well, I get the watch or I get the car now or I get the bag or the trip and they end up being lost. They end up trying to buy things to fill the holes in their souls but you turned to supporting others right off the bat where did that come from mm. well it actually came before the exit Jerome when I had this consultant come in then the light bulb went off that there was so much more that I could discover and I've always been fascinated by potential and really thinking about how do we unlock the greatest potential in ourselves and those around us. So I suppose the, the spark of interest went off then with this gentleman that came in. And so, as I said, sort of three years before the exit, I, I really immersed myself into the world of what gets people to be high performing, what gets in their way and what helps them really level up. And so I started that journey and I was starting to really feel the impact of what I was learning. 
And I just saw the fusion coming together. Um, and I'd been in events for 20 years, and now I was just excited for a new opportunity and for that chance to make a different impact. Um, so that's really where I felt that calling from. Wow. So most people don't know that they can sell a business. Even fewer people know that they can get support when they're going through the process of exiting. Tell me how you found out about the consultant and let's go on this journey of uncovering this gap that you noticed kind of in the your experience in the exit, because I think it can help so many people who are behind you on the journey for sure. Well, I think, Jerome, there's that classic, you realize you don't know what you don't know. And when you go through an exit, you've never, well, we've never been through it ourselves. So we didn't know. So I think it was natural. We had people in our network that had reached out to us. And so we had we had conversations there and it was incredibly supportive. So the people in your network, you started having conversations with people that you knew had those folks already exited before. And so you knew to ask them because they were further on the journey or... No, actually, the gentleman that I'm referring to hadn't actually had an exit, but he was working for a company that supported companies to exit. So he was bringing more of a sort of consultant's mindset and understanding what was needed in terms of leadership and mindset on that part. And then also some of the more sort of basic nuts and bolts of, you know, how you're going to increase your valuation. Yeah, everybody wants to focus on maximizing the valuation. But you don't. You decided to focus on the founder and them understanding what actually works. And so before we started recording, you showed me this really amazing model of a tree. And you talked about the work above ground and the work that's above ground. And so maybe if we can describe that for the listeners, mm -hmm. I think it would be really valuable for them to have that as a reference or metaphor that they can mm -hmm. use as they're going on this journey. Because you know, the things that you're discussing in this model are going to help them regardless of whether they're on exit one, which is leaving being an employee for another company or exit eight, where they're setting up their philanthropic foundation. So let's talk about the tree. Absolutely. And the tree really came from my fascination with what's the source of results. So that's what we're looking at. We know what we want to what we want to achieve, but how do we ensure we get there? And so this gentleman that I described that came into our business, he really sent me on this journey of discovery. And I was kept thinking, what is it that moves the needle? And I saw that the conventional approach was really focusing on what we're describing here as above the ground. So the trunk of the tree. And that's looking at actions, skills, strategies. And that's where most people believe they need to spend time. That's what we're told, isn't it? You know, at at MBAs and in generally in the majority of books, you hear people saying, get the strategy, take lots of action. And while this is important, a really important ingredient, what I realized it wasn't the source of the results. There was something deeper. And that's when I started to realize that we needed to go on what I call the journey below the ground. Mm. And many founders know will connect to what I term the shallow roots. So the shallow roots are the mindset and the vision and the value. So where am I going? What do I stand for? But often, Jerome, I don't know whether you can relate to this, sometimes that gets stuck on the shelf. It sits on the shelf, it was written once, and then it gets a little bit forgotten. So, and then they've understood and heard that mindset's important. So they've dabbled a little bit in that. But then what happens is they find they get pulled back above the ground because the above the ground is what's visible. Mm -hmm. You can see the action you're taking, you can see the strategy and it feels solid and you can measure the KPI. So it feels safe, shall we say. But actually what we start to see is that the mindset that it's not only the mindset that needs to be um, aligned to the to the actions, but we're going deeper here. Below the level of the mindset and the shallow roots, you've then got another layer, which is self-awareness. 
So we need to dig into understanding the impact that we have when we're communicating with our team, with our clients, with our investors. How are we showing up? What impact are we ha having? Because so often that can trip us up. And what I find is that most founders think that they're self-aware. And Jerome, there are some great studies that show that, you know, in studies of self-awareness, they say that about 80%, 80, 85% of people think they're self-aware. And then the actual study shows that only 15.15% were. So we start to realize these are areas of the roots that haven't been strengthened and deepened. Okay. And then on my journey, I've gone deeper to go, okay, mindset's important. Self-awareness is important. But I found on my journey that that wasn't enough. So I went even deeper and I was like, what else is there? It's almost like I was on a treasure hunt looking for that, looking for that diamond. And then I got into understanding the power of identity. So the power, the, the power of self-concept, it's that concept that you hold of yourself, those beliefs, that narrative that you tell about yourself, about being successful or not being successful, about um um, having great exits or not having great exits, about being a great leader or not being a great leader. And these all shape how we show up. Mm -hmm. And this self-concept then impacts our mindset, our, so our thoughts, our feelings, our actions and our results. So mm -hmm. the source lies in this depth. It lies right at the bottom of the roots in this identity. And so this is now where I work with founders of going, let's go straight to the depth. Let's look at, first let's play with, what's that, what's that exit that you want? What's that dream that you want to achieve? And if you knew you could, you could achieve anything, what would you love to achieve? And the operative word there, Jerome, is love. Because we're coming from the heart rather than the mind thinking, oh, can I do that or not? Okay. So there what we're doing is like we're bypassing in the zone of possibility. We're bypassing the stress and the anxiety and the imposter that we might have going on. Okay. So we want to gain clarity on what is this dream? And this part I love because you see people just coming to life on what is it that you want and why importantly is it that you want what you want that what you want so we're then looking at what is in my words the trillion dollar impact that you want to have because what i tend to see is that founders yes they want to make the money but what i see essentially is they want to create an impact and that's what sets their heart on fire so we connect to that. We gain that total clarity. And then we've importantly start to go, okay, that's the vision. Now let's go to the source of results. And let's think about that identity, that version of you. So mm -hmm. the Jerome 2.0 or 3.0 that is in alignment with your vision and your values. When we start to get clarity on this next level of you. And that's where the magic happens. That's when you start to get rid of and loosen those beliefs that have caused you stress or those stories that you've told about yourself that have held you back. Wow. So I want to go back to your, your discussion around self-awareness. How does somebody know if they're aware or not? Well, often they, as I say, often they think they are. But it's only when they start to get feedback that they start to realize that. And then I take people through a really powerful um, tool called the Enneagram. I don't know whether you've heard of that, Jerome. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, many people equate the, the, the um, Enneagram with a personality tool. I personally think it's a lot more. What I find is that personality tools tend to box you. Yeah. But what the Enneagram tends to do is it builds this self-awareness 
And most importantly, it gets you to understand why do I do what I do? What drives me? And it's when they connect to this that the self-awareness starts to happen and the light bulbs start to go on. And from there, we start to explore, okay, what are the fears? What are the, what's that world view that they hold? And then crucially, what are those blind spots that we might not be seeing? So the Enneagram, you said that's connected to our why. I want to make sure. Yes. So it basically looks at what you do, but more, most importantly, why do I do what I do? So it's getting under the skin, under the surface, so that you build that self-awareness and you understand, oh, that's why I do what I do. That's why I maybe have a tendency to often, often founders can be the visionary on the Enneagram and they think in very big picture, but they might have a blind spot for the detail. And they also might not want to look at some of the difficult challenges. They're like, no, it'll be fine. Everything's going to sort itself out. Yeah. Or you see that some people might be the competitive achiever that tends to be, this is a bit stereotypical, a little bit out for themselves. And yeah. they start to see, actually, oh, maybe I'm dominating. Maybe I'm shutting down my team. Mm -hmm. And if I start to be more inclusive, I can shift from what I term a diminisher, diminishing type of leader, to being this multiplier who really extracts and expands the potential of, of, of my team. And so that's the desired end state for anybody. If you think about athletes, the athletes that can get the players around them to do more than they would do if they weren't in the game, tend to win championships the business leaders who empower other leaders to be leaders so that they inspire their teams to do more, make more revenue and have happier clients. And I think this is just a beautiful example of what we can do as leaders, as transformation makers, as dream catchers to make that impact. I interviewed, our, our last week's interview is about a guy who wants to impact 3 billion lives. It's not quite the trillion dollar impact, but three billion lives is a pretty big number as well. And he said, I wanted to set a goal so big that it was impossible for me to be able to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm building something through a couple of different organizations where I'm putting capital and people who have the ability to use that capital to make impact together. And in that, I'm going to be the multiplier that gets to that three billion that by myself I could never do. So you are helping founders move from these lower order levels of leadership to th the pinnacle, which is being a multiplier. You're using tools like the Enneagram and some of the models that you've created in order to help them become one, self-aware, and then two, understand why they're doing what they're doing so that they can either make an adjustment so they don't do that if it's not beneficial or um, continue to lean into it if it's getting the outcomes that they want. The thing that I think is super fascinating would be really beneficial for the listeners now is to talk about how, when I think about your model, the stuff under the surface is the being, right? It's the values, it's your exactly. awareness, it's who you are without doing anything. Then there's some doing. I think about that as like the trunk, right? And so this is the stuff that you do. And then the results is the having. And so I usually try to boil things down to the be, do, have concept to see if it's in alignment. And I think what you have is an alignment. So can we talk about the results that founders typically see when they move from being a diminisher to a multiplier? Because I think for anybody who's not already aware or in this space, they want to know, well, what, what do I get out of making these adjustments? Because this seems to be working the way that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, sometimes people think it's working and they might well be getting a level of results. But what I often see is that 
it's almost that they don't know that there's a better way or they think their way is is good enough. And so often what I see when people come to me is that their stress, they're taking on the workload and the burden for, of the business. So often their 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 hours, they're working long hours, their stress level, they're away from their family, and they're feel, feeling that stress. And maybe they've got a team that's supporting them, but they know deep in their hearts that when I ask them, are you leaving potential on the table with your team? Their answer is, yes, I am. So it's by questioning that they realize that. And then what we see is that from the multiplier to the diminisher, so we've got a spectrum here. Hey guys, as you might know, a very small percentage of the people who actually listen to this podcast are subscribers. So do us a favor, subscribe. In fact, we did some analytics and we found out that only 25% of the people who listen are subscribers. And our goal is to get that to about 75% over the next three months. So do us a favor, hit the subscribe button so you get notified when our new episodes come. We plan to bring immense value to you guys going forward as we continue to improve the content that we create at Dreamcast. Your dream should be real. There have been all sorts of studies done which shows that the diminisher is only extracting and using 30 to 60% of the capability of their team. So let's say they're, pay they're paying one team member 100 grand, okay? And they're getting 50% out of them. They are leaving $50,000 pounds on the table that's wasted. When we get them to shift, build this self-awareness, build the understanding of others, which is also in, in important and something I do with the Enneagram as well. We then get them to shift, as you said, who they're being, how they're showing up in terms of presence and, and um, curiosity and the ability to empower and to stretch and to give ownership that takes far deeper levels of trust. When they embrace this, and trust being the operative word, then what we find is the multiplier is extracting between 80 to 120% of the potential. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Jerome, I get asked, well, how is it 120% then? And it's because potential is always expandable. And the more you, you as the leader can, can embed um, and encourage belief, you can get this person to believe in themselves, to stretch themselves, to surprise themselves, so that they are then achieving far more than they thought they would. And when you get this, you become, as the leader, the multiplier, but you become magnetic. So you start to attract the types of um, employees who are aligned with your vision and importantly with your values and your work ethic and with that desire for growth. And you start to repel those who are not like that. So if you think about that, if you're starting to attract top, better top talent, What's that going to do to your ability to create? Yeah. What's that going to do to your ability to innovate? Yeah. So that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing teams expand, profits go, grow up, but go up exponentially. And what I love is that the, the level of trust in the team goes up and the founder then is able to be less hands-on in the nitty gritty and work on the business and really on expanding and stretching that vision. Because we always know that there's a next level. Mm. We always know that there's a next level. I see so many folks settling for where they are and deciding that they can't do more, that they can't be more. Some people turn off their dreamer. Uh, they, they forget how to dream and they're still trying to live out or running on a program from their childhood. And so I just find it fascinating that you, 
use the phrase the way that you did. We always know there's more, there's possibility. And if we don't step into that possibility, we're probably doing ourselves and the world a disservice. And so I think you're challenging us to actually consider what's possible and then, you know, dare to dream and believe that your dreams can be real. Because if you don't, then you're probably leaving that potential on the table as you described it. And you made it monetary, but if we go to impact, I mean, how many lives could you impact Completely. if you really, if you really believed that it was possible and how many lives do you choose not to impact when you decide that you can't or you won't or it's not possible for you? Mm -hmm. That is just baffling that we would take the breath that we have and not use it to have the impact that we can. Life can be so cool. short. One of the guys I work out with, and then I'll come back to you. One of the guys that I worked out with for about two years, he recently passed away. Um, and I had just talked to him the day before. And so this thought that, you know, we're guaranteed time or, you know, we're going to live to a specific age is one that constantly gets adjusted for me. And it happens every 10 years or so where somebody that I feel like I could pick up the phone and call and it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for them to answer because we're in, in relationship um, they just vanish from the face of the planet and there are no more phone calls and there's no more opportunity to make impact. And so um, I'm in a place of reflection, a period of reflection as, as you talk about the possibilities. So I'm sorry, I kind of derailed it, but go ahead. And I'm so sorry about you to hear about your loss and, and it resonates, doesn't it? That actually how sad that people don't always create that impact and that level of fulfillment that they've wanted to so you know with what you and I do we want to encourage people to see possibility and to understand that it's natural that there are fears that's that, that there are doubts it's completely normal and that's the starting place and then what I invite people to do is just be curious courageous and curious and to step forward and as I say go to the heart say if anything is possible what would you love and then what we can do is once we've created that really drill into this autopilot and understand that about 95 to 98 percent of everything we do is on autopilot and this is set up from a survival point of view. Just imagine if we had to constantly think about everything we were doing. And from what I understand, our brain takes up 20% of our energy. So the autopilot is designed to keep us efficient and it's designed to help us survive. But sometimes it's helping us, it's keeping us, shall we say, stuck in what we think is a comfort zone. But actually, when we understand that we can, when we build awareness of what's going on in this autopilot, we then have a choice, a choice to make a change, a choice to choose a different narrative, a different story. And that's where the power lies. Mm -hmm. And it's getting people to understand that that is possible because at the source of results, when you upgrade that identity, that's still authentic and in line with your values, you can shift your thinking and your feeling. So when you go to the end of having achieved your goal, we start to question, what would be the beliefs, Jerome, that you would have now that you've achieved? Okay, so we're going to the end and, and deep diving into what we're feeling and what's true for us then? Okay, okay, okay. We're talking now, Tracy. How did you learn this? Because I mean, like, we're getting into metaphysics, and we're getting into some of the stuff that a lot of people don't have any real deep understanding or access to. So, how 
because I don't think the consultant took you down this path. Can it. we learn more about how you learned what you've learned and are now sure. sharing and teaching with other folks? Sure. I think the consultant was my catalyst. And then mm -hmm. it's, as I said, this journey of discovery. Sorry, just give me one. This, this journey of discovery. And um, as I say, it got me fascinated into what is the source. And I found that I was discovering things, testing them, and then thinking, is this really working? And then I met on my journey, this incredible gentleman who helped me understand a bit about quantum physics and how quantum physics and what's, what mystics have been saying for centuries is now aligning. And so what he got me to see was that quantum physicists, basically what they were trying to discover was what are the building blocks of the universe made of? Okay. And they started to see that there were subatomic particles that were pure, pure packets of energy, packets of p potentiality and possibility. And that these were not just particles, they were waves as well. So they had a jewel like nature. And everything was coming in and out of form at the speed of 10 to the power of 44 times per second. So what you and I have been taught is solid and stable and certainly seems like it is to us, actually isn't. So we're starting to understand through quantum physics that there's the energy there in fields of possibility and that it is shaped according to the observation we bring to it. So actually we are shaping and bringing this energy in. Sorry about these things. Okay. And and so what we then see there is that when you go to the tree, Jerome, and you go deeper than the identity of I am, you start to realize that everything is energy or awareness. Okay. So we are awareness, we are energy, and we are then conditioning that. So Jerome, if I were to ask you in this moment, are you aware that you're here on this call with me? What would your answer be? Yes. Yes. Yes, I am. So there, there's the awareness. And here what we see is we are aware of being aware. I am aware that I am here with you. And from there, we realize that's unconditioned. That's awareness. And then we realize that what we're doing when we take on an identity is we're conditioning it. So I am, I am Jerome. I am the podcast host of Dreamcatchers. Or I am Jerome something else. Mm -hmm. And so we are shaping how we are showing up. And so this was the journey I went on to really understand what is the source? Why is this identity important? And what I saw there is that we are literally creating everything. And Jerome, I used to hold that intellectually and think, okay, I am, this is who I am. I am Tracy, I am the coach. Mm -hmm. But it didn't always create a shift. And I saw with my clients, it didn't always create a shift at first. And then what I started to realize was we needed to introduce playfulness when we didn't when we weren't creating those shifts or we were feeling like we were forcing we needed to go back to that question i just asked you am i aware yes i am and when we sit with i am and we explore it often with our eyes shut we feel a peace we feel a sense of expansion and it's a sense of boundarylessness and a power. And we start to realize we are that source. We are the blank canvas that we are then creating the movie of our life on. on. And so reconnecting with playfulness to the I am then helps us introduce that. Now, some people go there, some people don't. But I find that being playful 
and visiting that base level really helps us identify with who we are. And then another level of playfulness that I love is thinking, okay, so awareness is like the screen, the blank screen, and we are the producer, the director, the screenwriter, the screenwriter, and the actor in the movie. So what's that movie we're gonna create? But we don't want to sit in the audience and watch that movie and be passive. We want to go into that movie and we want to be the trillion dollar impact version mm -hmm. of ourselves, Tracy. We want to embody it and, bre and bring it to life. And we want to feel it. And that's the additional level of playfulness that helps ground and embed that identity. Ground and embed. It's interesting that you use playfulness because I was just watching a video and it was talking about how fathers and children bond. And play is the way that they bond. And it teaches the children more lessons than pretty much any other way. They learn more through play than anything else. And so this thought that we can be childlike, play, I establish our new identity, mm. actually experience that, and then use that to transform the way that we do and have. It is just, I think, brilliant because now it doesn't feel like a grind. I don't want to grind. I never understood why people talk about grinding and they're excited about it or how they're the hardest worker and how they do more than everybody else. Like none of those things are exciting because you're. I don't believe that you're actually earning the thing that you are grinding or working harder than everybody else for. I, I think we're already worthy of it. I don't know that you have to earn it. I think there's some de deservedness that goes with this. And I, I saw your facial expression. So I think you have a perspective yeah. on this as well. And well, what's interesting is the belief that's underneath that. So people mm -hmm. believe it's about the grind and the hard work and the effort because that's what they've been brought up to believe. That's mm -hmm. what society has really told us. And that's what I love about going into the quantum physics and, and link it, linking it to the spirituality, because we're starting to challenge the status quo. We're starting to go, okay, this is what we're taught, but what if it's different? Mm -hmm. And it's when we start to shift these beliefs at the core that everything starts to shift. And once you shift the core beliefs about what this world is made of and how we're creating, you can then start to challenge the status quo in your industry to realize just because they've got that set of rules doesn't mean that that, that there's not another way does that make sense it absolutely makes sense and we're just going back to the realm of possibility which i think exactly. is a beautiful place to be mm -hmm. um, tracy i like to wrap up these episodes with two questions the first one I think you've got a, a pretty special network based on what you've told me from your success in business to this journey that you've been on through development and the folks that you're helping manifest this new self so that they can be a multiplier. And so I always look for one or two people that you think should be a guest on the Dreamcatchers podcast. There's a gentleman who is a client of mine who is totally inspirational called Harvard Lillibo. Uh -huh. Whether you know him, he is someone that completely connects to what we talk about, what I've talked to you about, and he's creating some really extraordinary unicorn companies that are seriously challenging the status quo. So he would definitely be one. Um, who else? And there's another gentleman called Ricky Patel who has a PhD in neuroscience, and he's starting to explore some really groundbreaking um, technologies. And again, he's a real believer in challenging the status quo, and he's lived and breathed the importance of shifting identity, what well, both of them have. So they, I think, could provide some really spectacular and intriguing and different inputs to you because they both they both are dreamers and they're dreaming big. Wow, I love it. I look forward to meeting 
those mm -hmm. two. It's funny. We had a niche on a couple of weeks ago and he does brain scans and then helps people create wellness plans on the backside of the brain scan so that they can actually get the brain functioning in the optimal state, which then goes off and impacts everything else. Mm -hmm. And so that's one question. The second one, and the one that I think is just going to put a bow on what's been an extremely thought-provoking episode for me, and I'm certain the listeners are out there like, man, I might have to play this one back again, mm -hmm. is what is the one thing you want the listeners to take away from our episode? that they can create the dreams they want. And the way they're going to do that is by intentionally creating the identity that is aligned with the vision and the values that they want to create. They have to create the identity that's in yeah. alignment with the vision and values. I, I call it congruency. Right. You, you got to be congruent. You've got to be aligned if you want things to flow. If not, then you create a bunch of turbulence and it, it becomes chaotic and you get a big old mess. But I, I think that you hit the nail on the head because that is what's going to be necessary to create all of the fruit on the tree that we talked about, which are the results from what you have from doing and who you are being. So Tracy, this was phenomenal. You're absolutely a dream catcher and you're inspiring other people to be dream catchers. Congratulations on your exit. And I just look forward to continuing to deepen our relationship as we go on this wonderful journey we call life. All right, Jerome, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I have to say the time has just flown by. And I'm very happy to talk to anyone who's got any questions because I do understand that some of that was quite complex. But, and so what's um, the best way for folks to reach out? Uh, LinkedIn is the best way um, to link out. Um, direct message me. And I'm always open, especially for your dream catchers, to offer a, a, a complimentary exploration session where we just talk about their dreams and look at what, what, what their identity is now and what that shift might might look like for them. Outstanding. So we'll have those, her tra LinkedIn, Tracy's LinkedIn um, link in the notes. Till the next time, your dreams should be real. We'll talk to you on the next episode.